In ancient ages, shapes mattered. At the start, geometry was hard-edged and sharp-cornered. The measurement of lines and angles was of paramount importance. Yet even when geometry was fixated on straightness, one curve always stood out, the most perfect of all, the circle. We see circles in tree rings, in the ripples on a pond, in the shape of the sun and the moon. Circles surround us in nature. Circles also give birth to other curved shapes. If we imagine, skewering a circle, on its diameter and spinning it around that axis, in three-dimensional space, the rotating circle makes a sphere, the shape of a ball. When a circle is moved vertically into the third dimension, along a straight line at right angles, to its plane, it makes a cylinder, the shape of a can. If it shrinks at the same time, as it's moving vertically, it makes a cone. Circles, spheres, cylinders, and cones fascinated the early geometers, but they found them much harder to analyze than triangles, rectangles, squares, cubes, and other rectilinear shapes made of straight lines and flat planes. They wondered about the areas of curved surfaces, and the volumes of curved solids, but had no clue how to solve such problems. Roundness defeated them. Calculus began as an outgrowth of geometry. Back around 250 BCE, in ancient Greece, it was a hot little mathematical startup, devoted to the mystery of curves. The ambitious plan of its devotees, was to use infinity, to build a bridge between the curved and the straight. The hope was that, once that link was established, the methods and techniques of straight line geometry, could be used, to solve all the curves mystery. And with infinity's help, all the old problems could be solved. At least, that was the pitch. At the time, that plan must have seemed pretty far-fetched. Infinity had a dubious reputation. It was known for being scary, not useful. Worse yet, it was nebulous and bewildering. People don't know. What was it exactly? A number? A place? A concept? Nevertheless, as you'll see soon, and in the other videos to come, Infinity turned out to be a godsend. Given all the discoveries and technologies that ultimately flowed from calculus, the idea of using infinity to solve difficult geometry problems has to rank as one of the best ideas anyone ever had. Of course, none of that could have been foreseen in 250 BC. Still, infinity did put some impressive notches in its belt right away. One of its first and finest was the solution of a long-standing enigma, how to find the area of a circle. Before I go into the details, let me sketch the argument. The strategy is to reimagine the circle as a pizza. Then we'll slice that pizza, into infinitely many pieces, and magically rearrange them to make a rectangle. That will give us the answer we're looking for. Since moving slices around, obviously doesn't change their area from what they were originally, and we know how to find the area of a rectangle, we just multiply its width times, its height. The result is a formula for the area of a circle. For the sake of this argument, the pizza needs to be an idealized mathematical pizza, perfectly flat and round, with an infinitesimally thin crust. Its circumference, abbreviated by the letter C, is the distance around the pizza, measured by tracing around the crust. Another quantity of interest is the pizza's radius R, defined as the distance from its center to every point on its crust. Suppose we start by dividing the pizza into four quarters. Here's one way to rearrange them. But it doesn't look too promising. The new shape looks bulbous and strange. With its skull of top and bottom. It's certainly not a rectangle, so its area is not easy to guess. While we're stuck here, though, we should notice two things, because they are going to hold true throughout the proof, and they will ultimately give us the dimensions of the rectangle we're seeking. 
The first observation is that half of the crust became the curvy top of the new shape and the other half became the bottom. So the curvy top has a length equal to half the circumference, C divided by 2. And so does the bottom. That length is eventually going to turn into the long side of the rectangle, as we'll see. The other thing to notice is that the tilted straight sides of the bulbous shape are just the sides of the original pizza slices, so they still have length R. That length is eventually going to turn into the short side of the rectangle. The reason we aren't seeing any signs of the desired rectangle yet is that we haven't cut enough slices. If we make eight slices and rearrange them like so, our picture starts to look more nearly rectangular. In fact, the pizza starts to look like a parallelogram. Not bad at least, it's almost rectilinear. And the scallops on the top and bottom are a lot less bulbous than they were. They flattened out when we used more slices. As before, they have curvy length C divided by 2 on the top and bottom, and a slanted side length R. To spruce up the picture even more, suppose we cut one of the slanted end pieces, in half lengthwise, and shift the half to the other side. Now the shape looks very much like a rectangle. Admittedly, it's still not perfect, because of the scalloped top and bottom, caused by the curvature of the crust, but at least we're making progress. Since making more pieces seems to be helping, let's keep slicing. With 16 slices, and the cosmetic sprucing up of the end piece, as we did before, we get this result. The more slices we take, the more we flatten out the scallops produced by the crust. Our maneuvers are producing a sequence of shapes that are magically homing in on a certain rectangle. Because the shapes keep getting closer and closer to that rectangle, we'll call it the limiting rectangle. The point of all this is that, we can easily find the area of this limiting rectangle by multiplying its width by its height. All that remains is to find that height and width in terms of the circle's dimensions. Well, since the slices are standing upright, the height is just the radius r of the original circle, and the width is half the circumference of the circle. That's because, half of the circumference went into making the top of the rectangle, and the other half got used on the bottom, just as it did at every intermediate stage, of working with the bulbous shapes. Thus the width is half the circumference, c by 2. Putting everything together, the area of the limiting rectangle is given by its height times its width, namely. And since moving the pizza slices around, did not change their area, this must also be the area of the original circle. This result for the area of a circle was first proved, using a similar but much more careful argument, by the ancient Greek mathematician, Archimedes, in his essay measurement of a circle. The most innovative aspect of the proof is the way, infinity came to the rescue. When we had only 4 slices, or 8, or 16, the best we could do was rearrange the pizza into an imperfect scallop shape. After an unpromising start, the more slices we took, the more rectangular the shape became. But it was only in the limit of infinitely many slices, that it became truly rectangular. That's the big idea behind calculus. Everything becomes simpler at infinity.